37. The Last Eagle Cassius lies handcuffed to the rails of the reinforced medical gurney in the center of the Sons of Ares Infirmary, the same place I watched my people die from the wounds they suffered to save me from his clutches. Bed after bed of injured rebels from Phobos and other operations on the thermic fill the expanse. Ventilators whirr and beep. Men cough. But it's the weight of the ice that I feel most. Hands reach for me as I pass through the rows of cots and pallets lying on the floor. Mouths whisper my name. They want to touch my arms, to feel a human without sigils, without the mark of the masters. I let them as well as I can, but I haven't time to visit with the fringes of the room. I ask Dancer to give Cassius a private room. Instead, he's been set smack in the middle of the main infirmary among the amputees. Adjacent to the huge plastic tent that covers the burn unit. There he can watch and be watched by the low colors and feel the weight of this war the same way they do. I sense Dancer's hand at work here, giving Cassius equitable treatment. No cruelty, no consideration. Just the same as the rest. I feel like buying the old socialist a drink. Several of Neryl's boys. A gray and two weathered ex-hell divers slump on metal chairs, playing cards near Cassius's bedside. Heavy scorchers slung around their backs. They jump to their feet and salute as I approach. Heard he's been asking for me, I say. Most of the night, the shorter of the Reds answers gruffly, eyeing Holiday behind me. Wouldn't have bothered you, but he is a bloody damn Olympic, so thought we should pass the word up the chain. He leans so close I can smell the menthol of the synth tobacco between his stained teeth. And the slagger says he's got information for you, sir. Can he talk? Yeah, the soldier grumbles. Doesn't say much, but the bolt missed his box. I need to speak with him privately, I say. We got you covered, sir. The doctor and the guards will Cassius's gurney to the far back of the room to the pharmacy which they keep guarded under lock and key. Inside, among the rows of plastic medication boxes, Cassius and I are left alone. He watches me from his bed, a white bandage around his neck, the faintest pinprick of blood dilating between his Adam's apple and the jugular on the right side of his throat. It's a miracle you're not dead, I say. He shrugs. There's no tubes in his arms or morphon bracelet. I frown. They didn't give you painkillers. Not punishment. They voted, he says, very slowly, taking care not to rip the stitches on his neck. Wasn't enough morphon to go around. Low supplies, as they tell. The patients voted last week to give the hard meds to the burn victims and amputees. I think it noble if they didn't moan all night from pain like lonely little puppies. He pauses. I always wondered if mothers can hear their children weeping for them. Can yours? I didn't weep. And I don't think my mother cares much for anything other than revenge. Whatever that means at this point. You said you had information? I ask. To business because I don't know what else to say. I feel the ironclad kinship with this man. Several asked why I saved him, and I could aspire to notions of valor and honor, but the deep spine reason is I desperately want him to be a friend again. I crave his approval. Does that make me a fool? Disloyal. Is it the guilt speaking? Is it the magnetism? Or is it that vain part of me that just wants to be loved by the people I respect? And I do respect him. He has honor. A corrupted sort, but true honor nonetheless. Was it her or was it you? He asks carefully. What do you mean? Who kept the obsidians from boiling out my eyes and taking my tongue? You or Virginia? It was the both of us. Liar. Didn't think she'd shoot to tell the truth of it. He reaches up to fill his neck, 
but the manacles jerk his hands to a halt, startling him back into the room. Don't suppose you could take these off? It's dreadful when you've got an itch. I think you'll live. He chuckles, as if saying he had to try. So, is this where you act morally superior for saving me? For being more civilized than gold? Maybe I'm going to torture you for information, I say. Well, that's not exactly honorable. Neither is letting a man put me in a box for nine months after torturing me for three. Anyway, what the hell ever made you think I'd give a shit about being honorable? True. He frowns, creasing his brow and looking startled, like something Michelangelo would have carved. If you think the sovereign will barter, you're wrong. She won't sacrifice a single thing to save me. Then why serve her? I ask. Duty? He says the words, but I wonder how deeply he means them any longer. In his eyes, I glimpse the loneliness, the longing for a life that should have been, and the glimmer of a man he wants to be underneath the man he thinks he has to be. All the same, I say, I think we've done enough evil to one another. I'm not going to torture you. Do you have information, or are we just going to dance around it for another ten minutes? Have you wondered yet why the Sovereign was suing for peace, Darrow? Surely it must have crossed your mind? She's not one to dilute punishment unless she must. Why would she show leniency to Virginia? To the Rim. Her fleets outnumber those of the Moon Lord rebels three to one. The core is better supplied. Romulus can't match Roke. You know how good he is. So why would the Sovereign send us to negotiate? Why compromise? I already know she wanted to replace the Jackal, I say. And she can't very well have a full-scale rebellion on the rim while trying to cuff his ears and fight the sons of Ares. She's trying to limit her theaters of war so she can focus all her weight on one problem at a time. It's not a complicated strategy. But do you know why she wants to remove him? My escape, the camps, the disruptions in the helium processing. I could list a hundred reasons why installing a psychopath as arch-governor could prove burdensome. All those are valid, he says, interrupting. Convincing, given, and they are the reasons we provided Virginia. I step back toward him, hearing the implication in his voice. What didn't you tell her? He hesitates as if wondering even now if he should tell me. Eventually, he does. Earlier this year, our intelligence agents discovered discrepancies between the quarterly helium production logs reported to the Department of Energy and the Department of Mine Management and the yield reports from our agents and mining colonies themselves. We found at least 125 instances where the Jackal falsely reported helium losses due to the Sons of Ares' disruption. Disruptions which didn't exist. He also claimed 14 mines destroyed by Sons of Ares' attacks. Attacks which never happened. So he's skimming off the top, I say with a shrug. Hardly the first corrupt arch-governor in the world. But... He's not reselling it on the market, Cassius says. He's creating artificial shortages while he stockpiles. Stockpiles? How much so far? I ask tensely. With the surplus inventory from the 14 mines and the Martians reserve? At this rate, in two years, he'll have more than the Imperial reserves on Luna and Venus and the War Reserve on Ceres combined. That could mean a hundred things. I say quietly, realizing just how much fuel that is. Three quarters of the most valuable substance in the world. All under the control of one man. He's making a play for the Sovereign. Buying senators? Forty so far, Cassius admits. More than we thought he had, but there's another kink which he's involved them in. He tries to sit up straighter in his cot but the manacles around his hands anchor him to a half-slouched pose. I'm going to ask you a question, and I need you to tell me the truth. I'd laugh at the idea if I didn't see how serious he is. 
Did the Sons of Ares rob a deep space asteroid warehouse in March, several days after your escape, about four months ago? Be more specific, I say. A minor main belter in the Karen cluster. Designation S1988, silicate based junk asteroid, nearly zero mining potential. Specific enough? I reviewed the entirety of Several's tactical operations when I was making my recovery with Mickey. There were several assaults on Legion military bases within the asteroid belt, but nothing remotely like what Cassius is talking about. No. There were no operations on S1988 that I know of. Gory damn, he mutters under his breath. Then we judged right. What was in the warehouse? I ask. Cassius. Five hundred nuclear warheads, he says darkly. The blood on his bandage has spread to the size of a gaping mouth. Five hundred, I echo. My own voice a distant, hollow thing. What was their yield? Thirty megatons each. World killers. Cassius, why would they even exist? In case the Ash Lord ever had to repeat Rhea, Cassius says. The depot lies between the core and the rim. Repeat Rhea. That's who you serve, I ask. A woman who stores enough nuclear warheads to destroy a planet, just in case. He ignores my tone. All evidence pointed to Ares, but the Sovereign thought it gave several too much credit. She had Moira investigated personally, and she was able to trace the tags of the hijackers shipped to the defunct shipping line formerly owned by Julii Industries. If the Suns truly didn't steal them, then the Jackal has the weapons. But we don't know what he's doing with them. I stand there, numb, mind racing to piece together how the Jackal might utilize so many atomics. According to the compact, the Martian military is only permitted 20 in its arsenal for ship-to-ship -ship warfare, all under 5 megatons. If this is true, why would you tell me? I ask. Because Mars is my home too, Darrow. My family has been here as long as yours. My mother is still there in our home. Whatever the Jackal's long-term strategy is, the judgment of the Sovereign is that he will use the weapons here if his back is to the wall. You're afraid we might win, I realize. When it was Severus' war, no. The Sons of Ares was doomed. But now? Look what's happening. He looks me up and down. We've lost containment. Octavia doesn't know where I am, whether or not Aja is alive. She has no eyes on this. The Jackal might know she tried to betray him to his sister. He's a wild dog. If you provoke him, he will bite. He lowers his voice. You might be able to survive that, Darrow. But can Mars 